for running our code, let's complete the setup. For this, we essentially follow the steps on the documentation. So all the steps of the readme and the GitLab repository. It involves loading the environment. So all the steps needed to bring our software to the cluster. Also, it covers how to copy data to and from the cluster. As an overview, let's remember where we are. Taking the simplified network overview from the theoretical part, we are now on the front end. We can use the front end to prepare our computations. These could involve downloading software or creating any environments that we need for our code. Note that while you do have internet on the front end, you might not have internet or usually you won't have internet on the compute nodes. So any dynamic library loading or installation needs to be done via the front end. However, you should also not block the front end with your installations. I like the heuristics from Princeton Computing, the 10-10 rule. It says you can use 10% of the resources, so 10% of the CPU cores and memory, for up to 10 minutes on the front end. Let's see how this looks in practice. I already looked into the cluster and cloned the deep learning with GPU cores. However, to run any code, I do need the Anaconda environment. All software that's frequently required for a lot of user jobs you will find in the module system. With module avail, we can see all software installed on the cluster. Let's grab our Anaconda. See that the current default version is the 2011. To modify our environment so that it contains the necessary path, we can simply do module load anaconda. Now we need to do the actual conda setup. So now we need to create the anaconda environment. We will name it DDL for deep learning minus GPU and use Python 3.8. We can also check the installation path. And we see that I installed it in my home folder under the content directory. Let's activate the environment, install our required packages. You see here that our environment is currently activated. We now need to navigate to the requirements.txt file to install all our required packages. You see that for each library, we also noted down the specific version. This helps us to keep our environment reproducible. Let's install everything with pip. Note that the installation of all packages might take a while. Let's recap. We have the module system in which all frequently used software libraries are located. More specifically, by using module load, we can modify our environment so that the path and necessary variables are set in our current environment. So each time we want to execute something in our Python environment, we first need to do module load. and then activate our specific environment. You will find these two commands in all scripts that execute your code. If there's software that's not available on the cluster via the module system, you can either install it yourself via spec or also write a ticket to us. If you are using containers, I have good news. Although we can't run Docker containers for security reasons, it's possible to run Singularity containers. 
For a deeper dive into how to, please have a look at the NHR documentation site. We prepared our environment in which we want to run the code. The next step is to learn how to copy data to and from the code. Again, let's link this back to theory. On the very right side, you see different storage options. You can also see that they are connected with different speeds. Most importantly, we have a shared space. In nearly all compute clusters, the space which has the quickest connection, so InfiniBand or OmniPath to the compute nodes, is called Scratch. This means if you frequently load data or receive results, you should do this on the Scratch system to have the quickest access. However, be aware that there is no backup on the Scratch. So if you have any research data that you need to keep even years from now, you should always make a backup copy. You can do so by taping your data. The tape archive is another storage space. The data is physically written on tapes and stored in a shelf. We also have a home folder available for our users. Here you can save small files or also configs that you frequently use over your projects. It's also possible to use other storage, such as S3 buckets. Now let us see how it translates to the shelf. Right now, you can see that I'm in my home folder. So this would be the equivalent to this home folder in this figure. We do have limits on how much you can save in your home folder. So please try to put your frequent in and out of data to the Scratch. On the Scratch system, you might have shared projects with other users, but you also have a personal Scratch space. For me, at Scratch user Nip Sommer, for you, it should be Scratch user VSET course account and then the number of your account. For the course content, we already made a Scratch folder that's accessible by everyone. You can see here that we have the data for our workflow in the synthetic tree, either with full resolution or also with a downsampled resolution. But what if you want to use your own data in your own projects? There's a specific tool that you can use exactly for this purpose, which is called rsync. Let me open another shell, which resides on my local machine. So right now, on the top shell, I'm on my local machine, and on the bottom shell, I'm on the cluster. Now let's say I want to take this example file from my local machine to the cluster. You can use rsync to copy any file. What you have is from where you want to copy, which can be either file or a full directory, and the location to where you want to copy. So this is your username at the host at this repository. If this command should not work for you, you might solve it by passing a minus i flag. So minus i and then your identity to your SSH key. You can also download anything from the cluster in the same way. You just swap the order of the arguments. So, first the repository that you want to copy that now lives on the cluster, and secondly, where you want to copy it to. So, the dot just represents the current directory. You can also use SCP instead of rsync. However, in contrast to rsync, SCP just copies the stuff over without checking whether any data is maybe already available. So if you do a regular data transfer, I would advise you to use rsync. 